Good day. And today we're going to be diving into the second of our seven values is our local community. And that's the second value is enable transformation through the spirit and the word. And when we speak of transformation, what do we mean? Uh, a diet program might transform you. A heavy dose of fasting might transform you. Um, asceticism might transform you. Perhaps, you know, mind altering drugs might transform you as well. I don't recommend that. And by transformation, we don't just mean living a good life even because many people, many non-Christians live very good lives. We mean more specifically that we grow in Christ likeness, that we grow up into Christian maturity. And Paul writes in Colossians 3.10 that we've been clothed with a new man that is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. Well, John puts it this way in 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed, but we know that whatever, whenever it is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And so, friends, John here is wanting to say to us that we're not going to fully know what it's like when we to be glorified, you know, to be fully like Jesus. But we know that we will be like Jesus. We will be like him in his resurrection. And so having been made in God's image, we're going to take on his likeness because we've it's been revealed to us now what God is like. He's been revealed as the one on the cross, the, the risen, crucified one, the one who lays down his life for the other, who comes not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so our, our transformation is to grow in this Christ likeness. And we believe that happens through these two things, through the spirit and through the word. And so in the gospel, according to Matthew in chapter 22, the Sadducees are trying to catch Jesus out by seemingly referring to the Jewish book of Tobit and the woman who's been married to seven brothers, each of whom have died. And they're trying to come to Jesus and say, well, if the resurrection's true, then who will she be married to in the resurrection? And Jesus turns around and he says, the resurrection's not like that. There's not going to be marriage or giving in marriage. Um, but then he says to them in verse 29, Jesus says, you know, neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And the Sadducees are trying to rationalize the faith. They want to deny parts like the resurrection and these supernatural elements. And Jesus is pushing back with a focus on the word and the spirit, with the scriptures and the power of God. Those two realities that bring transformation, which they're denying. And in recent years, it's become quite trendy to define churches as word and spirit churches. And R.T. Kendall, who pastored at Westminster Chapel for 25 years, said this, when the word and the spirit come together, revival will follow. And it's been said before, all word and no spirit and we dry up. All spirit and no word, we blow up. But with both the word and the spirit, we grow up. And the way that R.T. Kendall is talking here, you could be forgiven that he's talking about some form of spectrum where you've got word focused, Bible focused churches over here. And you've got spirit focused, sort of more charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches over here. And perhaps that might be true to a respect. But no Bible church over here is going to say that they're doing whatever they're doing without the Holy Spirit. And no Pentecostal church or charismatic church over here is going to say that we're doing Anything without the Bible, even if the Bible might be downplayed, perhaps, in some um, corners of that movement. And so Andrew Wilson, a well-known reformed charismatic, um, you know, from the New Frontiers um, movement, a leading UK theologian, asks, well, what then is a word and spirit church? What do we mean? And the answer is this. Obviously, at one level, it's simply intended to say that a church believes in the Bible and believes in the work of the Holy Spirit. But so does every evangelical church. You've never met an evangelical who says they don't believe the Bible or the work of the Holy Spirit. So the phrase must mean more than that. 
or people would simply just identify as evangelicals. On another level, it implies not just believing in the word and the spirit, but holding them in an appropriate balance. And I think that, that phrasing is key. We want to hold the word and the spirit in an appropriate balance. History is littered with charismatic groups uh, that, from our perspective, have veered off track. They became unhitched from the word of God. Uh, the early Montanist movement, um, you know, in their belief that the new Jerusalem is suddenly going to descend in central Turkey in the year 177 AD, or the violent Munster rebellion in 15. 34, or the failed prophecies of the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormon Church with all their additional scriptures because of prophetic revelation. And to, to prevent veering off track in any direction, we need to keep the Bible central to all that we do and to our identity. But the opposite error is also true. We want to avoid um, being in a place where we start denying that Jesus doesn't do miracles or today or that the spirit world is reduced all the way down to a very special book rather than being inhabited by angels and demons and all the other hosts of heaven which the Bible talks about. Andrew Wilson again says, by word we're committed to the absolute authority and accuracy of scripture even when it flies in the face of ecclesiastical tradition, church tradition, contemporary culture or intellectual fashion and spirit, we're committed to experiencing, not merely believing in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit today, eagerly desiring the spiritual gifts and especially prophecy and taking the book of Acts as a vision of what the church life can be rather than a record of what it once was and pursuing the baptism in and the filling with the Holy Spirit. So when we here in the park say that one of our key values is to enable transformation through the Spirit and the Word, we mean that we want to see Christians grow up into Christ-like maturity while experiencing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit whilst committed to the absolute authority and accuracy of the Holy Scripture. So when thinking about this transformation through the Spirit and the Word, it's important to perhaps acknowledge that we as subjects are often unable to witness to the transformation that's happening within ourselves. We journey towards growing in this Christ-likeness maturity, but it, that growth isn't always in a linear fashion. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes we veer off track. Sometimes we need to be brought back onto the straight and narrow. Sometimes we just go around in circles for years and years. God loves us. He's patient with us. And the truth of the matter is, as Martin Luther suggests, that we're both simultaneously saints and sinners, this side of the resurrection. We're called saints and we're becoming saints. But sometimes we do sin. Sometimes we do mess up. But we are called saints and we're becoming saints. We're becoming what we're called. And these are important things to consider. How, how do we know that we're saved? Uh, what are we getting? Where are we getting this assurance that we are saved from? Is it from a burning in the heart? Uh, what happens when we're not burning? Is it from our good, victorious life that we're living? What happens if we aren't living in victory? Is it our rock firm faith? But what happens when doubt creeps in? Is it from the fact that we speak in tongues? But what happens for those who don't? Are we looking inward at ourselves what we can do or we've achieved are we looking outward to jesus christ something external rather than something internal our hope always lies outside of us with christ and his cross so our feelings can and they do change they go up and down they become stronger or weaker but we can look at outward things symbols you know, visible words, that we have been united to Christ. Baptism. We can say, I am baptised, I'm united with Christ. We can look at Holy Communion, his blood for me. Okay, I might not feel that. I might not get that. But I know that it is for me. I'm part of his body. 
because I've taken of the bread. These are things that are outside of us. They're not subjective to do with our feelings and how we're, the, what motions we're feeling at the, at the moment. And Christians talk about the sacraments. They talk about baptism and communion as visible words because they're physical objects that have been tied to specific promises in the Bible. And God's always had a habit of doing this. So we look at the rainbow at the very beginning in Genesis 9. In verses 12 to 13, we're told, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I've set my bow in the cloud and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So God, you know, he hangs up his war bow and he says, I'm never again going to flood the world. I'm hanging up my weapon of war. Never again is this going to happen. I'm not going to destroy the earth in this way again. OK, but that's a sign of the covenant. It's the visible word. It's the, and every time you see it, it's a promise to us. OK, it's a promise that is given. OK. And so we have these very physical, earthly elements, water, bread, wine. And yet they're combined with a command and a promise from Jesus as a form of, of grace and salvation to us. Baptism is the drowning of our old life. It's the forgiveness of sins, delivering from death and from the devil and grants union with Christ in the resurrection life. So the promises come to us. So Galatians 3, 27, all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. If I've been baptised, then I'm clothed with Christ. It's a promise for us. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ has been raised from the dead in the glory of the Father. So too may so we too may live a new life. OK, so I've died in baptism so that I can live a new life. I am dead. Therefore, I can live to Christ. Holy Communion. It, this is the new covenant. OK. Again, it's that symbol of union. There's forgiveness of sins. There's also life and salvation. And the promise is given to us in John 6, 56, uh, 54 to 56. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me and I in him. So when we doubt, when we don't have that burning in the heart, when we're feeling isolated from God, when we feel alone from God, we can declare, I am baptised. And we can speak to ourselves saying, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. I might not feel that, you know, the, the emotions I'm feeling, you know, the stuff that's going on, on in my mind, the doubts or the worries, whatever I'm going through, you know, the fact that the devil might be shouting all my sins in my face. OK, the accuser may be roaring at me. And yet I can say the one who eats the flesh and drinks the blood has eternal life and will be raised up on the last day. And the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me and I in him. So Christ is in me if I am drinking from Holy Communion. OK. These are promises external to us. OK. So we can believe that. that there's promises attached to these signs that come to us. So when we doubt. When we hear the accuser roaring and he says about all of our sins, all the things that we've done, all the things that we should have done, we can say, though the accuser roar of things that I have done, that we know one who has lived for us and lived a perfect life for us. OK. So these outward things are promises of spiritual realities for us. They're visible words that are outside of us. They're objective signs that speak into our subjective experience. 
And in John 15, Jesus himself refers to himself as a vine. And he says, believers are the branches. So unless we're connected to the vine, no life flows through us. And baptism is that visible sign of our attachment to the vine where we die and we come alive in him. It's the beginning of the union as we're grafted onto the vine. And then Holy Communion is that visible sign of getting nourished from the vine. It is true food, as Jesus says. It's true food that feeds our souls. Okay, it's, We're stuck onto the vine and then we're, we're nourished and sourced from the vine. Okay. So Jesus Christ, the one who walked with Adam in the garden, spoke with Abraham, wrestled with Jacob, met face to face with Moses, the one whom Joshua chatted with and spoke to Samuel. The same person stepped into Israel's history to fulfill the promises that he had made to the Jewish people. And he was born of a virgin of David's line. He died for our sins, removing them from us. He took the burden of our sins, the Holy One for the transgressors, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the holy, the immortal one for us who are mortal. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb and he was raised on the third day. He appeared to many, showing indeed that he was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at the right hand of God as Lord, King and Messiah. And he will come again to judge the world and set it to right. So just as he had been with Israel in the cloud and in the flame in the wilderness, so too now he comes and dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And Paul puts it this way in the second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. And in Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not because of my own righteousness to derive from the law, but because I have the righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness. A righteousness from God that is in fact based upon Christ's faithfulness. So we're accepted by God, not because of our good works, but because of the faithfulness of Christ for us, for you. The faithfulness of Christ for you. As Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the gospel to Abraham ahead of time, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So, friends, when we say that one of our key values is to enable transformation through the spirit and the word. What we really mean is we want to see Christians grow up in Christ like maturity, placing their hope not in their own growth or in their own good works, but in Christ alone, whilst experiencing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their everyday lives that are rooted in the absolute authority and the accuracy of Holy Scripture. And there's a quote often attributed to the reformer Martin Luther, and it says, God does not need your good works, but your neighbour does. And this point is that that vertical relationship between you and God is based upon the work of Christ. It's about not about your works, but about his faithfulness to God as the Messiah. And the, relate, the horizontal relationship between you and the world. Um, and they need your good works. Your neighbours do. Your family need you to step up and be a good father or a good mother. Your, your wife or your spouse needs you to be a good husband or wife. That you love them. That you put them first before your own needs. And your children need people who can point them to Christ. And people need friends. People need people who can come alongside them and just build them up and encourage them. Paul says in Galatians 5, 13, For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So friends, the freedom that we have in Christ is used to serve one another 
in love, to love the other for the sake of the other alone. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, Paul writes, Now these are different gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different results, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each person a manifestation of the Spirit is given for the benefit of all. For one person is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, another the message of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the one Spirit, to another performance of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. It's the one and the same Spirit distributing as he decides to each person who produces all these things. And this is a wonderful truth. That God doesn't show favouritism in dealing with people, but each of us receives a gift for the benefit of the whole. What matters, therefore, is love and a desire to build up and empower the whole body of the Messiah. So in conclusion then, and this is our heart for this church, that we be a place where the, the Holy Scriptures are lifted up, where we allow the Holy Spirit to run the show, as it were. And he's the one who gives the gifts. He's the one who equips the church. He's the one who brings conviction of sins and points us to Jesus Christ and his saving work for us. Amen. Let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would lead us right now to the saving work of Christ for us, that we would look to those external signs of Christ upon the cross for us, delivered to us uh, in baptism, in communion, as we look at those outward symbols of those heavenly realities, that we're united with Christ through baptism, that we receive the forgiveness of our sins through uh, Holy Communion. And we pray, Lord, that you would also be with us and guide us and lead us right now, Lord. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we might be transformed through the Spirit and through the Word. We pray. Amen.